Thank you very much. Thank you, Mike, for leading the first part of our service, and thank you all for your love, generosity to me. There is no clock, and I can't really see the hands on my watch. It's just there as a status symbol. Um, so I don't know when to finish. So Stanton, if you'd like to wave at me when it's time to finish. Well, that was quick. <laughs> Thank you. Well, I'm going to look at the last four verses of 2 Corinthians. Someone told me that since this is my last sermon, I can tell you lot whatever I want, and you can't sack me. And I thought that was a very good idea. So I'm going to tell you exactly what I want. But I'm not going to be mischievous. Not like the minister who had had real problems with his assistant minister. It just wasn't working out. They were, they were a headache. They were a, a pain to each other. And in the end, the minister thought, well, I'm just going to go. So his last sermon he preached from Genesis 22.5, pointed to the assistant minister and said, quoted his text when Abraham was taking Isaac up Mount Moriah. He pointed at the assistant minister and said, you stay here with the ass while I go yonder. <laughs> Well, I'm going to be as relevant as I can be this morning, and I'm going to tell you how to behave as a church. And I'm not going to give you my own ideas, but I'm going to explain how the Apostle Paul said this to the church in Corinth. He gets to the end of his last letter to them, and he tells them how he wants them to behave. Well, actually, he tells them how God wants them to behave. And... This is the way that guarantees God's presence with them. Verse 11, the end of it. And the God of love and peace will be with you. This guarantees God's presence with you. In other words, if you aren't like this, then uh, God won't be with you in love and uh, peace. And so it's vital we behave this way. So first of all, we learn in verse 11 how to behave as individuals. This is what you must do, right? I'm talking to you individually. And you'll notice that first of all, Paul calls them brothers. Uh, today, we would say brothers and sisters. And we skip over this when the Apostle Paul mentions it, thinking he's just being friendly. We forget that in Paul's day, under Roman law... It was a criminal offence to call someone brother if they weren't your blood relative because it affected inheritance law. But the Christian church is counterculture. And since Jesus Christ has forgiven us our sins, since the Holy Spirit has given us new life, since we know God as our Father, we are brothers and sisters. We are God's family. So the government might not have liked it, but we must recognize each other as brothers and sisters because we are family. We are God's family. Never forget this. We are not a club that you join and leave at your convenience. We are brothers and sisters. We are family who are committed to each other. Think about it. Brothers are those you will give a kidney for. You will drive through the night and through the rain and wind and storm to help them. You will put up with them whatever they're like. We're family. We're brothers and sisters. And then he says goodbye. Actually, the Greek word he uses is literally translated rejoice. It's a bit like when we say cheerio. Are you saying goodbye or are you saying be cheerful? Well, for us, if I said cheerio, it would be saying goodbye. But for the Apostle Paul, when he uses this word rejoice, he's probably not saying goodbye. He's probably saying rejoice, be joyful. So I thought about that. I say goodbye and you rejoice. And we're being biblical. <laughs> but why does Paul tell us to Rejoice. Doesn't he realize how hard the Christian life is? And for them, slaves, many of them in Corinth. And for us, here we are. Some are dying. Some are bereaved. Some have long-term unemployment. Some have long-term illnesses. Some people have massive family problems. Some people are 
are experiencing awful trials and temptations. And here is the Apostle Paul telling us to rejoice. No, no, no. He should be telling us to be mourning. He should tell us to meet together and sing sad, doleful lamentations. We don't want to be always rejoicing. Well, it all depends on what rules in your life. If your problems control your life, then of course you won't always be rejoicing. But if you see above your problems, if you see the God who reigns supreme, if you see the Lord Jesus Christ who has died and risen again to forgive you all your sins and to bring you to glory and who works for your good in all things, and that nothing can separate you from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus, then you rejoice. My sister's baby died. We laid her in the grave. We wept. And my brother-in-law came up to me around the grave and said, Chris, this doesn't change the ultimate truths. God is still good. The gospel is still true. Jesus is still Lord. Our trials don't control us. Jesus does. And so we always rejoice because Jesus has already won the victory. This is why our services are to be characterized by joy. Whatever my problems might be, whatever I've come from at home or what I'm facing at work tomorrow, Jesus is Lord. And so we rejoice. Martin Luther, the great reformer, his wife, walked into his study one day dressed for a funeral. He looked up from his books and he said to her, who's died? She said, the way you were grumbling, I thought God must have died. <laughs> Do we give that impression? My problems rule, God's dead. We must repent, change our attitude and rejoice. Thirdly, aim for perfection. Something happens to me when I get into a car to drive somewhere. I just happen to assume that the road I'm on leads directly to my destination. I never seem to realize that I might have to take a turning off the road. I have wasted hours and hours and hours on the motorway, going the wrong way, because I didn't realize that I'd had to leave at junction something like number 15. And we can often be like that spiritually. We just keep going as I've always been going. And Paul says, you need to be on a better road. And you say, hmm, I'll stay on this road. That's not good enough. That's not why the Holy Spirit lives within us. That's not why we've been given the word of God. You are not to stay as you are. You must aim for perfection. And this word perfection here, it's in Greek, it's the word restoration. It means aim for full restoration. Imagine your house catches fire. By the time the fire brigade get there, it, the, the house is half ruined by fire and by the time the fire brigade leave the other half is ruined by by water and your house needs restoring doesn't just need a lick of paint some polythene over the windows it needs full restoration and so do we sin has ruined our lives our priorities are all wrong our attitudes are corrupted. Our desires are selfish. Our relationships aren't wonderful. Our walk with God is mediocre. And Paul says, turn off onto that better road. You don't have to stay as you are. There, there is so much more wonderful progress for you to make. You can be filled with joy and love. Indeed, you can rejoice with joy unspeakable. You can know the full assurance, the absolute certainty of heaven to come. You can be powerful in prayer and witnessing. There is so much more to experience. Don't think that you have arrived. Aim for perfection. Every day for breakfast, I have toast and marmalade. Anybody else have toast and marmalade? Are there any marmalade freaks here? You can see you, yes. It's, your orange ears gives it away. 
Well, I love toast and marmalade, but I hate sticky fingers. Are you like that? You hate... Last week, I had two pieces of toast and marmalade. And by the time I started making it and finished it, I've had to wash my hands three times. I've got all this sticky stuff. My fingers, awful. But a few weeks ago, Charlie broke one of his toys. I bought him this toy. Lovely. It cost me $1.99 from Bernardo's. <laughs> and he dropped it, and it broke. One of us was heartbroken. So I decided I was going to mend it with super glue. So I went into my garage and I got out my old tube of super glue. You know how you have to stick a pin in the end of it. Well, as I was sticking, pressing down on the tube of super glue, the super glue came out, a split in the back. And instead of the glue going on the toy, it went all over my fingers. And now I had sticky fingers. I was stuck to the tube of superglue. I was stuck to the toy. And my fingers were stuck to each other. <laughs> and I thought, you know, marmalade's wonderful. <laughs> marmalade's nothing. This is sticky. And some of us, our spiritual life today is a little bit sticky like marmalade. And we think that's good enough. And we don't realize there is so much more. So much more to experience. Read the biographies of Whitfield and Wesley. Or go on to the reformers. Or go on to the prophets. Or the apostles. And realize that we were, we're just spiritual toddlers. There is so much more still for us to experience and enjoy. Don't stay where you are. Aim for perfection. And you know, your wife won't know what's hit her. Your parents will be bowled over. Your neighbours will be amazed. And God will be glorified. And your life will be reflecting the beauty of Jesus. Fourthly, listen to Paul's appeal. Again, this is difficult to translate. In Greek, you have three voices. You have a passive voice, an active voice, and a middle voice. And here, if Paul is writing in the passive voice, it means listen to my appeal. And if he writes in the middle voice, he's saying encourage one another. And it can be translated either way. Uh, both are important, and you have to guess which it means. And I think it's translated correctly here. I think Paul says, listen to my appeal. Because there is a terrible danger of just assuming that we know the truth. Assuming that God agrees with me. And whenever I read what Paul says, I just don't need to listen to it. I just assume it agrees with me. Well, let's never be like that again. If necessary... Get out pen and paper, and when you read your Bible each morning, write down what it actually says, what it actually means, how it actually applies, and act upon it. Listen to the Apostle's voice. And fifthly, be of one mind. Now, this sounds impossible. Some of us find it hard to be in one mind all on our own. So how can hundreds of us be in one mind? But, you know, we all want the church to be of one mind, don't we? That's what we want. The problem is, I want it to be of my mind, and you want it to be of your mind. But we all want it to be of one mind. So how on earth can we be in one mind? Well, the answer is easy. We're all to be of God's mind. Not my ideas, not your ideas, but we're all 100% committed to following God's word. The Bible rules. And when the Bible is dogmatic, we're dogmatic. And when the Bible is silent, then we are not vocal. You say, well, that, that sounds great. But what about those things the Bible doesn't mention? What about how we run Sunday school? What about who should lead the youth work? What about should we have an evangelistic mission every year, every other year or whatever? What do we do here? How can we be in one mind? Well, again, the answer is easy. We do what the Bible says. And the Bible says 
obey your leaders. That's what we have leaders for. But you say, I don't like the things that leaders do. Well, that's why you're told to obey them, because otherwise we wouldn't be of one mind. And when we are all following God's word, we will be like that, this school of fish that you see on these uh, nature programs, all staying perfectly together, all moving beautifully, going in the same direction. And sixthly, live in peace. It's not enough to intellectually be of one mind. We've got, got to also emotionally be of one heart. Sadly, people can be intellectually of one mind, and yet they can still speak and act in ways that are not peaceful. And sometimes it's because they're so stressed. And sometimes it's because they're unwell. It's not always because they're being deliberately sinful, but it is always unacceptable. It grieves the spirit. This is how we must behave. And if we do, the God of love and peace will be with you. It's fantastic. Our lives overflowing with the love and peace of God. Now, if, we are, if you're not experiencing this, there's only one person to blame, and you know who that is. And you know what to do about it. And if you do it, then the God of love and peace will be with you. Well, that was my first point. How are we doing for time? Ah, oh, that's all right. The next two points are very short, actually. Second, verses 12 and 13, how to behave as a congregation. If my, my last point was what you must do, this is what we must do. This is how we must behave. And he says two things. First of all, in verse 12, he says, greet one another. Well, he says, greet one another with a holy kiss. I put down, greet one another as family. Caroline and I, as many of you know, often go on holiday to Spain. And in the church we go to, after the service, all the pretty young girls come up to me and kiss me twice. It really makes my holiday that bit special. <laughs> Mind you, when I go to Poland, at the end of the service, the men come up and kiss me three times. <laughs> but we are British, at least many of us are. And we tend not to kiss. That's not our culture. Some of us don't even hug. Our culture is to shake hands. When I meet my own brothers and sisters, I shake my brothers by the hand and I kiss my sisters if I can catch them. <laughs> now, says Paul, church is family. So greet people as your brothers and sisters, as your uncles and aunts. Be friendly, but be spiritual too. Greet one another with a, in their culture it was a kiss, with a holy kiss, a Christian hug, a spiritual greeting. Don't come and go on your own, ignoring everybody. We're family. Don't just associate with your own little group. We take communion together. We're family. Greet each other like brothers and sisters. And then the other thing he says to us as a church is how we must behave is to greet other churches warmly. Verse 13. All the saints that's in their church there send their greetings. We must be in good relationship with all God's people. Paul is clear, it's all the saints send their greetings. That's the people of God. We're to be in good fellowship with each other and in good fellowship with all gospel congregations. We're not in competition with other churches. If we need to change or we need to move or we need to send lots of people out to help another church so that the gospel flourishes even more, should we do it? Of course we should. This is how we must behave. And thirdly and finally, verse 14, what to pray for. This is how we want God to behave. This is how we need God to behave. May the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. This verse is so well known. It's probably, today, it's probably the best known verse in the whole Bible because so many church services where they might not even open the Bible, they still end their service with this verse. So, Lots of people know it, but even though we know it off by heart, many have never stopped to understand it. Notice Paul ends by blessing the people. In the Old Testament, when Jacob was dying, he gathered his sons around him and he blessed them. When Jesus walked on this earth, the mothers brought their little children to Jesus and he laid his hands on them and blessed them. 
And as Paul ends his letter, it's as if he lays his hand on the head of each person in the congregation there. And he says, may the triune God bless you. This is not some ritual just to end a sermon or to end a letter. This is what we need. When you put your little children to bed tonight and you pray with them, you ask God to bless them. When you visit your aged aunt in her care home, before you leave, you pray with her and ask God to bless her in her care home. Indeed, we need to bless those who curse us. We need to be those who bless and do not curse. Notice that the Apostle Paul asked the triune God to bless them. Some of us are uncomfortable here. We pray to the Father in the name of the Son by the help of the Holy Spirit. And that's the normal way to pray. But here the Apostle Paul asked Jesus Christ for something. He asked God the Father for something. And he asked the Holy Spirit for something. And that doesn't surprise us because we are reconciled to God. We are reconciled to the personal triune God. Paul is happy praying to the triune God. And Paul asks for massive blessings. He doesn't ask for health and wealth. He doesn't ask for success and happiness. He asks, may the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with you. Grace is undeserved help. If we're going to accomplish what God has given us to do here, we need help. But however hard we try, we can't earn it and we can't deserve it. We need grace. So every day, pray for grace from Jesus Christ for Lansdowne Baptist Church. God is able to give us grace because Jesus Christ has taken our sins away and Jesus Christ has given us his righteousness. And so for the sake of Jesus Christ, God can give us this undeserved help. Pray for grace. Next, Paul asks for love from God the Father. You know what it is to have God's love filling your life. You're cross and upset with someone. You're just about to ring them up and bend their ear on the telephone. Because you're so angry, so hurt. But you stop, you get down on your knees and you pray for them. And as you start to pray for them, that God will bless them. You feel all that anger, that hostility draining away. And you find God's love being poured into your heart by the Holy Spirit. And you find you have love for this person. Indeed, you have such amazing love for this person that you will gladly die for them. This is Calvary love. This is the love of God poured out into your heart. All of us need this. Stuart Briscoe, when he was a young uh, preacher, after one service, he was standing at the back shaking people by the hand and a little old lady came up walking on her walking stick and she got her walking stick and she tapped him on the chest with it. She said, young man, I can tell that you love prostitutes. (laughs) He coughed and spluttered and was cutely uncomfortable and embarrassed. Yes, she said, I love prostitutes too, but they don't love them in here. I have been trying to reach them for years, but they don't love them in here. But I can tell that you love them. That dear old lady was Miss Stuart Watt, a retired missionary from the Belgian Congo. And in her 80s, she was trying to reach those whose lives were in the grip of destructive behavior. She was driven by the love of Christ. The Apostle Paul knew what that was too. He says the love of Christ compels us and he prays that this love of God will saturate the church and we must pray every day for the love of God to be with us here at Lansdowne and then he prays for the fellowship of the Holy Spirit not fellowship with the Holy Spirit but the fellowship produced by the Holy Spirit when we are filled with the Holy Spirit we are find ourselves bonded as one with the people of God. We can't help it, because if we walk in the light, 
As he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another. Now, something may go wrong for a while, but we can't let it remain wrong. We can't let the friction remain. We have to be in fellowship because we're fighting the same battles. We serve the same Lord. We're reaching the same generation. We must be in fellowship with each other. So every day, pray for the fellowship of the Holy Spirit to be with us. And so I come to the end of my last sermon as minister here. It's been a privilege and an honor to work here, but I too have to say goodbye. Not simply cheerio, keep smiling, be joyful, but God be with you, which is what the word goodbye means. This is the greatest need of every church, that God is with us. And this is guaranteed for us if you take seriously the commands of verse 11. Finally, brothers, rejoice. Aim for perfection. Listen to my appeal. Be of one mind. Live in peace. And the God of love and peace will be with you. So let's just take a moment before we sing. Let's examine our own hearts, our own responsibilities. How am I doing behaving as an individual? As a church, let's pray how we're doing as a church. And let's pray that God would act in grace and love and fellowship being poured out upon us. Just have a moment of prayer, then we'll sing. We're going to sing. Well, we'll announce that in a minute. Let's just be quiet. Heavenly Father, we thank you that your word is a lamp to our feet and a light to our path, showing us the way to go. And we pray that as the Hebrew slaves, the children of Israel, followed the pillar of fire, may we follow the light of your word. And may your love and peace, indeed may you, the God of love and peace, be with us all. Amen.